I have about a hundred retro chips to test, so it's time to get the Retro Chip Tester Pro put together so I can see which of them work. Before I can start testing chips, I need to turn this pile of parts into this. I've been putting off putting this thing together for about a year now, and I can't count how many times I've said in videos, I need to get to that. This week I finally got in the last part I needed to build a Retro Chip Tester Pro. I've been collecting parts for this thing for months. So it's time to get to it. I just saw a video by uh, Knowles Retro Lab that was really great. It inspired me just to get going and make it happen. So the Retro Chip Tester Pro and parts. So. Here is the board, and right now it's in a 3D printed little deal I did off a of thing of hers. So the way I like to do something like this is as I go, if I finish a step, I'll mark it out in green. If I am uh, have to skip a step because I'm missing a part or something, I'll mark that in orange so I can find it again later easily. So one thing I like to do on my resistors is I like them to be nice and neat and uniform. So I don't usually just bend them with my fingers. I'll bend them with a pair of uh, pliers. So now I got this nice, neat row of resistors. But the problem is, if I turn them upside down, even with these bent back, inevitably one or two of them will move out of position. So to prevent that, I'm just going to put a little strip of tape along there. And normally I use blue painter's tape, but this electrical tape is like 20 years old, and it's getting old and not working very well. So... It's going to get used for this soldering joint number one. Got a nice solder on a new printed circuit board. A lot easier than something that's old and oxidized. The journey of a thousand solder joints starts with a few dozen. Hey, if you were looking for wisdom, maybe you've come to the wrong place. There we go. A nice, satisfying, clean row of resistors. I've only got that many left, and that's just the 470 ohm one, so I'll be back when those are all on. Stop that! Stop that! There's not going to be a montage while I'm here! Okay, okay, here you go. All the resistors are in, except a few that I need to order and install later. The next step is to install the banks of diodes, like this. Cut that out! Cut that out! You've already done enough montages, so you better get used to the idea! Aww. I just want to montage. So I soldered in all the diodes and I realized that even though I was only done with the first step, I was about halfway done with all the soldering. Sweet. So next up is soldering on all the transistors. And that went like this. And no montages. <laughs> oh, go and get a glass of water. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. <sighs> The final bits were all soldered on, including the voltage regulator and relays, transistors, sockets, and capacitors. I also assembled the DC to DC power board and installed standoffs on it and the LCD display. The missing resistors and a capacitor that needed ordering because some dorkwad had ordered a 474 microfarad cap instead of the 474 nanofarad one that was needed. Hey, it was only off by a thousand percent. So, once everything was put together, I programmed the controller. And you don't want to see that. I fumbled around for hours trying to deal with a process I was not familiar with. In the end, it turned out that the USB tiny programmer that I'd bought was not ideal for the task. But with the help from a few online posts, I finally got it to work. At first, I wasn't even sure it was working. Every time I tried to test a chip, it said it failed. After having the same result on some known good ICs, I dug in to figure out where I'd gone wrong. It turned out that the substitute switching transistors suggested by DigiKey had a completely different pin assignment than the recommended ones. 
I honestly can't say if I knew when I ordered them over a year ago and forgot, but the solution was to simply replace them with some 2N2222As that I had on hand. These also have a different pin assignment, but since they are the exact opposite of the recommended ones, I just had to solder them in backwards and bazinga! We're testing chips! So, I think we're good. Now let's start testing, let's start some chests and some whips. Let's start testing some chips. With about a hundred retro chips to test, I'm not going to bore you with every single one of them, but let's take a look at a few of the more interesting ones. Now this right here is actually out of the pet. It's a 74LS86. Seventy four eighty six quad two input nor gate. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Oh, that sucks. Seventy four eighty six. Let's hit OK. Chip OK. So it's good. You know, as crusty and rusty as it is, I'm still not putting it back in the pet. Sorry. So I have to agree with Noel. This thing really needs a rotary encoder. The push button system was probably fine when it first came out and had a limited number of ICs that it supported, but now it supports so many different chips that it can be really cumbersome to find the one you need to test. Still, it's an amazing device that I plan to use very frequently. One nice thing it comes with is a downloadable HTML database with thousands and thousands of ICs. So you look up the chip you need to test and it tells you what setting to use. Sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes it's not even subtly obvious. This is 1541 and 1571, so drive chips. So this is labeled 1571 Jiffy DOS, so let's see if it recognizes it. Jiffy DOS 1571 U2, the chip is good. 27256, labeled 1571. Commodore 1571, 310650 03. Oh, that is on there. Yeah. So there's a couple kinds of EPROMs. Uh, one type was Commodore ROMs, basically being burnt on an EPROM. The other type were program ROMs. These I found interesting, and they're for putting in the Commodore 128. So the retrochip tester recognizes the Commodore EPROMs and even Jiffy DOS EPROMs, but the program ROMs it doesn't recognize. It just gives a CRC code. Uh, so all I could do on these for now was to test them by checking the CRC code and making sure that it was the same every time. If it's continually changing, then you know the EPROM's bad, but if it's the same every time, there's a good chance it's good. Uh, once I get another 128 restored, we'll have to play with some of these and just see how they work because there is a socket in the 128 just for adding these program ROMs. I also found several Jiffy DOS EPROMs for the Commodore 128 and the 1571 and a 1581 Kernel EPROM. There was also a couple of Basic 8 EPROMs. Basic 8 was an upgrade to the Commodore 128's Basic 7 with added graphic commands. There were a few RAM chips, most of which were good, and a dozen or so TTL chips, also mostly fine. Finally, there was a big pile of original Commodore ROMs, mainly kernel ROMs for the 64, the 128, the 1541, and the 1571. I presume these were pulled from machines when installing Jiffy DOS, because Carl clearly loved it. I mean, what's not to love? Okay, this is an original one, 901229-05. Um, but that's going to be a 23 series chip. The Commodore ROMs had another challenge. Uh, while an EEPROM or erasable programmable read-only memory is labeled with the IC type, such as the 27256s that we were just testing, the original ROMs are masked ROMs and they're labeled with a Commodore part number based on its contents, not the IC type. I started by guessing, but that was silly. So I went to the schematics for some and Google where the schematics are not at hand for others. I made notes as I went and I'll add a page to my blog where you can see the results. As I come across new ROMs, I'll add them so you can easily look up the correct settings to use for a given Commodore ROM. So when all was said and done, I had a lot of good ROMs. I will add a list of all the different ROMs that I tested and which were good and which were bad, and I'll put that in the description below. So the next thing I need to test is the 16 RAM chips from the PET 4032 I'm working on. 
but that's got to wait for the next pet video. When it's ready, that video will be right here. In the meantime, you might like this video where I repaired a Commodore 64, and I got to tell you, that would have been a lot easier had I put the Retro Chip Tester Pro together before I fixed it.